Well, it's another episode of uh, In Conservation With. Uh, it's a Zoom series, as you may or may not know, which talks, or should I say, I talk to people who are movers and shakers, movers and groovers within the world of conservation. And there could be anyone ranging from scientists, you know, working on PhDs through to someone writing a book, through to someone just interested in an element of nature that's not necessarily a, a, a professional. So anyone involved in a world of conservation. And uh, I'm really quite, um, I always say I'm excited because I am excited, but I'm really happy um, that I've got Lyra Valencia here tonight, um, a young conservationist um, that many of you may not know, but we're going to know by the end of this hour. And by the way, if you're watching this in the future on YouTube, please like and subscribe, tell all your friends, um, not just about this episode, but about all of them, and look forward to seeing you again, absolutely. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome my good guest, my good, now, I, I want to say friend now, actually. We are friends, Lyra. we are. <laughs> Lyra Valencia, how are you and where are you? Good, thank you. Thank you for having me. I feel super honoured. Um, and I'm currently in Croydon in London. You know, Croydon in South London, back in the day, before yeah. it was called Croydon, apparently its name was Saffron Valley. I think it was uh, named by the, by, the, by the Celts. Saffron Valley. It's a beautiful name, isn't it, compared to... How did Croydon. you know How did you know that? <laughs> so random. Well, I wrote, a book, I wrote a, uh, an article about urban birding in, in, uh, in Croydon, and I did... Oh, wow. Oh, that's... Actually. I need to read that. No, I had no idea. Well, that sounds super fancy. I wish it was still called that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So listen, tell us, tell us about yourself, because obviously we don't know who you are, many of yes. us. I mean, obviously you are well known. You've got massive following on Instagram, but for those who may not watch Instagram, I mean, I know, for example, you're born and raised in Croydon, as you say. Yeah. And you, uh, you're trying to shed light on the importance of nature connection within urban communities, which I think is one of the most important jobs to do, because... Most of us live in urban areas, and this is one thing I think we may need to, need to talk about because um, mm. I think that, and I always this is my thing I bang on about all the time. I think that nature is always portrayed as something over there somewhere, and yeah. taken a million hours just to film two seconds of something, yeah. something, something, something over there, you know, which is not connected to me. This it becomes a form of entertainment. Right? Yeah, I agree. Well, um, just to introduce myself, yeah, my name is Lyra Valencia. Born and raised in Croydon, uh, I currently work for the London Wildlife Trust part time. Um, so I work on one of their sites, which is an urban wetlands, Walthamstow Wetlands. Maybe people have heard about it. It's actually Europe's largest urban wetlands. So there's like ten massive reservoirs, um, and they supply thirty percent of Londoners with drinking water. So it's a huge wetlands. Uh, the nearest train station is Tottenham Hill. If you're thinking to go, it's literally a ten minute walk from there. Um, so I'm there three days a week, um, just because it's so far as well. Like, it'll be ridiculous to travel there every day. But it's and a trek, isn't it, from Croydon? It is. It takes me about two hours to get there for work. But I guess that's why it's so important to do what you love, because once I'm there, I totally figure out the journey. Like, I, I love being there. Like, I actually look forward, like, I'm going there tomorrow, and I, I look forward to work. Like, I want to go. Cannot wait to be there tomorrow. Um, and then on my other days, like David said, I do social media. Um, it's not something I like, like, I don't know, thought about doing. It just kind of happened naturally within the past year. Um, but yeah, so I do that part time as well now. Okay. Listen, let's, let's kind of wind back a bit. Um, okay. you, you know, against all the odds, as you say here, you grew up fascinated about the natural world and you from an early age that you wanted to work with wildlife was there a kind of a moment when bam that's what i want to do or were you kind of born thinking you know i want to do this like yeah there wasn't a moment where i was like bam i know i want to do like i want to work with it's like from a young age like it's, it's well known throughout my family and friends like from when i was little like could barely walk like i was just obsessed with like greenery around me like insects like i was never really scared of like spiders or anything like that I had like from when I was little like I had this real like almost obsession with snails um my grandma's back garden was the only green space like that I was regularly in contact with um which is a small little garden like urban garden in Streatham 
in South London and um, she had lots of snails and I would spend all my time just like looking at snails, collecting them. I even admittedly like, used, I don't know if this is right, but I used to like steal my grandma's nail polish and mark them, like mark them with like different colour nail polish <laughs> and then try to find them on my like next visit, which now studying zoology, I know that that's actually a form of like, um, ecologists use this, um, what do you call it, like a procedure or process called mock capture release to like estimate a population size. I thought well, you said you were going to use me big words today. Yes. You told me you're going to keep it all low, low key. But I just wanted to such a cause because from when I was little, I was basically a scientist. I didn't even know I was doing that. But yeah, I used to mock these snails like go back home and then on my next visit try to collect these snails that had these markings on it with my like grandma's nail polish um I just started like that so and then I thought it was pretty normal being like connected to nature and it was it wasn't until like I grew up and you know kind of went to college and I realized it's not so not so normal <laughs> you know I'm um, talking about marking snails it's funny um I used to in my previous life I used to work in in advertising and I worked as a PA to a director that made videos and, and music videos and um, ads. And he did an ad for Guinness. Um, and one of the Guinness ads was a bunch of snails racing each other. Um, and it was the first time I've ever seen snails with their shells with one, two, three written on them, you know. I see, we could you? <laughs> Unfortunately, I, mean, I, I had to go an accident because I was, I was meant to be transporting them to the set and I was in the back of a, a, a car or something and the car jolted and I stepped back and I oh, shot them no. in number 21. Oh no, but were they like garden snails or those like big no, snails? Big, big ones, which was even worse because it wasn't oh. pleasant. Yeah, oh God, it must have been horrible. <laughs> what a sad story. <laughs> but whilst growing up being interested in natural history, what was the vibe around you? How did people take that? your family and friends, you know, you being this obsessed with nature, because it wasn't normal, was it? No, I guess like my parents like were always quite supportive. Like my first pet was actually a pet snail called Patrick. And like, they let me keep him and like, kind of obsessed over his snail. Um, and like, they would, I guess, try to take me on walks, but they weren't nature people. And plus, they were also like, new to the country so like going like to the countryside or like to rural areas wasn't something that they felt comfortable with nor did they really know anywhere but like London and like other family homes and stuff when you said so, they were new um, to the country sorry Lyra when you said they were new to the yeah. country where, where did they come from so uh, my mom's from Colombia um and she came when she was Uh, 24 um and then my dad came to the country um he was like I think he was like five or six so he was um and yeah he's like he lived in London and hadn't moved away like ever since like just stayed in London so I guess like yeah there was like first generation to the country like English not being their first language um so yeah I guess like going like to rural areas or like hopping on the train and going quite far from like where they've like like lived and know like in in London like was a bit scary for them maybe that's why they didn't take me to the countryside um and also it's just I don't know maybe it's just not their interest like they just weren't walkers or hikers like um so yeah so I guess in that sense like my family didn't really feed my passion so much although they were supportive and like tried to be as supportive as possible like they weren't like they didn't really know what to do with my passion and then my friends like I always tried to hide it from my friends because I knew it wasn't like something that was normal do you think because for, for me for example I had a similar scenario when I was interested in nature and other other people weren't why do you think well let's just go straight to this I mean there's yeah, not yeah. any ethnically diverse people publicly out there yeah in Britain I know there's there's a few in the US and maybe obviously in Africa there's there's some there but yeah. in the Western world there's very few ethnically diverse people out there sort of standing on pedestals talking about nature why do you think that is why do you think there's such a, a lack of you know bodies behind this interested in it oh like we can talk and I'm glad we've got an hour or like less than an hour but there's I think there's so many different reasons um I think 
Oh, okay, I think one representation, obviously, we're not like it's colored people, people like from different backgrounds, and stuff, but they love na- like people, like we're examples, good examples that you know, we do have interest in nature, but then I guess people we're not represented in like, um, like when you open like a, like a wildlife magazine or you switch on your telly and you, you see these people like traveling the world or like doing these like nature exploration stuff, like you don't see people who sound. Uh, or look maybe like us uh, or from diverse backgrounds so that could make people well that made me feel like growing up like it wasn't meant for me because whenever I did switch on my telly or even in my like when I went to study zoology like my whole course I think me and like three other people out of like 300 students in my zoology course were of color um there was one black person on my course which was shocking and they dropped out um and I, I've spoken to them because I'm like still friends with them like one of the reasons why they dropped out is because they just didn't feel like it was for them like represented um so representation is really like I think a big one in the UK anyway um if you don't see yourself in these spaces like you're obviously gonna start doubting like it's just it's just human nature like if you don't see yourself reflected in like or represented in a space you do feel a bit like you know it's not for you um I'll Oh, sorry. Is there anything you wanted to comment about that? I've got loads of questions, but carry on. Okay. I was going to say, also, I think when it comes to... um, This is... I don't know. I don't know, David, like, how you feel about this, but um, I come from, like, a poor background, like, low socioeconomic background, um, and spending time outside um, is a privilege. Like, you know, a lot of my family members, like... My mum at one point, my aunties, my uncles, who I would love for them to, like, go for walks, like, are working three to four jobs. Like, they're trying to make ends meet. <laughs> um, like, hopping on a train to go somewhere. I, not that they need to, but, like, let's say they really wanted to go to, like, I don't know, do a massive hike along a cliff or something or see something really cool. Like, um, they can't afford a train ticket all at the time. Um, and even if they wanted to go to a local, like, a local patch, like, they just don't see... They're in such survival mode, like... They can't, they don't have the time, I think, to like, well, they don't know how to make the time to, yeah, uh, appreciate nature, I guess. Do they have that opportunity back in Colombia and Chile, do you think? Well, this is the thing, it's so much easier because, you know, where we where we live like, back in Colombia and Chile, like, you are sur- like, immersed in, in nature just naturally. Um, I mean, things are changing. Like, not everyone in Colombia lives in, like, the mountains uh, but my my family in particular like we live on a farm um surrounded by mountains with lots of nature around us so like you know we're naturally like just around nature all the time back home um yeah I come from a family of farmers so like nature is really important like you know in our everyday life um so yeah here is a bit more difficult because like especially in London yes we can like this is what I advocate for like yes you can connect with nature in London but I'm not saying it's like super super easy like you you have to be taught how to it's not just as easy as stepping outside your door and like being amazed by nature it's something you have to be taught and learn um so yeah maybe that goes on to the next reason why as well our communities are not engaged it comes down to education and just we're just not um, I mean, I guess with uh, like most of society now in the UK, like we're just also disconnected like from nature. Like it's not important. We're not taught in school like how to connect with nature, why it's important, um, and like working with nature is still a taboo. Well, it, it was when I was in college and that and university. That wasn't that long ago. Like we weren't told like how to get a green job or like work in conservation. If in fact you're kind of a bit discouraged. Like I remember like yeah like teachers and family saying like maybe you should keep that as a hobby you know conservation should be like a hobby like nature like you know um spending time with nature and and being outside should just be kept as like a hobby not don't try to make a career out of it or don't try to work in conservation because it doesn't pay well we're going to talk about that later but what do you think it will take to get representation to get people to of color to be more involved and more interested, certainly in the UK. I mean, obviously we can't talk about anywhere else at this point, but. Um, I think things are changing. I don't know about you, David, but I think that especially since 2020, I noticed that there was a lot more grassroots um, communities, like particularly run by like POC, people of color, who 
we're like, you know what, nature is really important. We haven't been represented um, or connected to it in like previous years. Like we want to change it. Flock Together is a really good example. And um, there's Black Girls Hike as well. Um, and I just saw a lot more kind of like uh, Instagrams popping up of like people of color, like going outside and enjoying nature, making it cool, no matter like where they're living in. And a lot of them were from like urban backgrounds. Um, yeah, I think there is more, I think there is more hype now. And I think for like urban connection to nature, um, I think things are changing. There's a lot of work to be done because there's one thing like, I don't know, for example, like, a big TV program that we all watch that comes on, you know, different seasons and like having like a colored person on one of their sets, but then you got to look behind the camera. Like is the team diverse behind camera as well? And um, if not, why? Um, yeah, I think, yeah, it's a bit, a bit complex, but I think things are changing at least now, like these brands, like brand, outdoor brands and like magazines and like TV shows are thinking to like start bringing in more representation. I think they they, they kind of realise like it's been a bit bad before. Yeah, I find that the, in the nature sector, though, it's, it's there's a lot of tokenism, I find. I, I think that especially when I watch things on BBC, you get yeah. the occasional person who's sort of carried on for maybe a couple of things and then see you later yeah i mean you've been in this game wait i'm super new to this and i i get asked the question how do you know when it's tokenism and i still don't i'm still like something i'm still learning like when i'm even my voice or my image is being like not taken advantage of but yeah just used um it's something i'm still like trying to gauge but i know that's that's definitely a thing you know they just use a face and use a voice and like try to act like that's representation also one person like using the same colored person let's say for like a series or something is not representation because we're all so different me and you are both people of color but we're so different you know and that's another thing i yeah like i try to be wary of when people try to say oh like you know lira like you know you're the voice of like urban communities i'm not because like the people around me are so diverse like there's, there's just no way I could talk for all, you know, like urban communities or every single person. Like we all have different, you know, needs and like um, come from different places. Um, yeah, so that's why I think it's so important to have more, I guess, uh, influencers or wildlife, you know, content creators or or presenters that are like out there and, you know, trying to be a voice for our communities because one person or a few people is not enough. I mean, I've, I, in my career, when I first started TV, which was now 18 years ago, you know, I was told, I oh, know, I don't know that old, I know. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> wow, no, it's really good. I was told under no uncertain terms by the commissioning editor of the programme I was on, if you were white, you wouldn't be on this, even if you had the same knowledge and what have you. And my then agent who took me on said the same thing to me as well. And I had to make a decision. I thought to myself, this is obviously positive discrimination. This is tokenism, but what do I do? And I thought, well, you know what? I'm going to use that stage and do what I want to do. So that's what I ended up doing. And I think that, you know, during the course of my career, doing what I'm doing now, I've seen that people come to you and say, as you just said, you're the voice of whatever, you're the voice of, no, all of us are voices. You know, it's like when people talk about, oh, who's going to be the next David Attenborough? No one's going to be the next David Attenborough. Because Everyone's so us, different. All of us will be the next David Attenborough, if if we're going to have to call it that. Because mm. at the end of the day, all of us have different voices. All of us have things to say. And I think my problem when I watch broadcasting now in natural history is that there's only one or two voices. Um, and they're the same middle class white voices that basically are talking to everyone. And you can't do that because you know, a lot of people aren't listening because they don't relate to it. So, you know, that's why I came, when I came across you, I was like really excited because as you say, there's a few people, um, not just people of color, but there's a few other people generally just out there, young people doing some really great stuff on online. And I came across your feed, um, Lyra Outdoors, is that right? Or yeah, uh, outside with Lyra. That's what I just sorry. Good. Outside of Lyra. <laughs> I almost forgot. <laughs> Outside of Lyra, remember that, guys. Yeah. <laughs> on to that. Follow her. Thank uh, you. 
basically, you know, I loved your freshness and you're, you're normal. You're just talking normally. And I love the fact that, you know, you're talking about stuff and I can tell that you know what you're talking about. And I'm not being, you know, facetious. No, no, no. I know, but you got, you know, you got the, the study, you've studied it, you can tell. But it's a skill to then relay that in layman's terms. It's a skill to say what you say and have people who have had no interest previously say, oh, wow, that's quite interesting. And then look at you, you've got 66,000 followers or something now on Instagram. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And a lot, and a lot of those, followers like are people who are like everyday like Londoners or city city dwellers you know like people who haven't you know don't own a pair of binoculars or don't work in their sector or or um, and I know that because when I do talks or when I do walks or workshops the people that turn up they're like Lyra like before you I never used to like listen to birds or you know take a moment and stop at like a patch of flowers or something you know I never used to look up and like now I'm starting to because yeah because of your enthusiasm I think I think enthusiasm is really important because I can I'm so enthusiastic I get really excited over like the, the smallest things I think it rubs off on people you know what if you just can turn one head and this is for everyone watching this in the future whatever if you can just turn one head then you've done your job and that's what I say that's what that's exactly what I say I, I, my aim is not to like influence consciousness I just want at least one person to like to change their view on wild like, I've made it then for me I've made it like if, if it's just one person like you know starts to like recognize or or listen to like bird songs or you know go for walks like I for me I've, I've made it and I think that's why I do the job that I do because I live for that you know like that that excites me yeah. it's a shame that conservation is the way it is because in terms of being involved in it because you know it's obvious that you have to have some kind of funding behind you to even volunteer to do stuff. I remember when I went once to the Channel Islands and I was on Alderney Island and I was with the Alderney Wildlife Trust and there were people, you know, volunteers there and I was talking to them. They were saying to me, yeah, we're here, but I've got to pay for my rent and my food. And plus I have to pay to get here, you know, fly here, what have you. And I was thinking, how do you survive? And it's obvious that they could survive because they had parents, you know, that were supporting them. So yeah. for someone like you or like me, when I was a young guy, how did, oops, how now yeah. does anyone get involved with nature as a volunteer? I mean, how do you do it? You know, how can you actually afford to do it? I mean, that it's in itself is a barrier, isn't it? Yeah, that's a massive barrier. And um, before I go on to like some of like, the ways I found, like, yeah, that experience was just so disheartening. Like, it, in fact, after my uh, degree, after I finished my degree in zoology, I just got a job um, in IKEA as a cashier. Um, also was a beauty technician because I made a lot of money in London at the time. and still does, actually. But um, I did that because uh, all the jobs I was looking for after I finished my degree said I need to have voluntary experience that is something that I cannot, couldn't do because I had, you know, family to support, um, you know, like living in London is so expensive and I just had like, it was just, I couldn't, I couldn't, I didn't have the time to like volunteer. So it's a massive barrier um, for people who don't have family that could support them. My family could barely support themselves, I was supporting them. So um, yeah, it was really difficult, like disheartening time. And yeah, that, for two years I, I you know, uh, gave up with conservation. But the way I found, uh, so, in 2020, um, in the lockdown, this is two years after I graduated now, um, it kind of like, for me, it was a blessing in disguise because it like, like many people, it kind of slapped me in the face. I was like, Lyra, what are you doing with your life? Like, you know, you're working as a cashier, you have, you're sitting on this like, you know, depth of knowledge and this passion. Um, you need to like, look back into conservation. And that's when I looked online for like paid voluntary opportunities or internships and BirdLife Malta came up. Um, and they were recruiting at the time. I don't know how because we're in lockdown, but they applied and um, I got in and yeah, I left. I, I think I left like September 2020 or something to go to BirdLife Malta, who were doing like paid internships. Okay, before we talk about Malta, I just want to just finish off on a volunteering thing because, yeah, you know, when I was, again, when I was younger and I yeah. considered the idea of volunteering, for me, volunteering is all about going to an island, growing a beard, not eating much, getting skinny, 
yeah. birding in, and really kind of, you know, working on, you know, your hands to the bone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that, I mean, it was like a badge of honor. And I've, I've always, even though that's a very extreme kind of uh, sort of thought of how they, that actually works, I always appreciated those people, the conservationists on the ground doing stuff because they're the ones that they they're the ones that should be celebrated. And I always, in my work, try to celebrate those people doing that hard work because I didn't do it. Okay, because I, for whatever reason, I just didn't do it. But what advice would you give now for someone watching this who thinks, you know, what I want to make a, I want to try and make a difference in my own small way. I want to go and do something somewhere. What advice would you give them? Um, I think, yeah, as well, like, don't think, like, globally, because as well, like, with volunteering, you often think you need to go away, um, and often these volunteering experiences to go to an island and, like, work with turtles, let's say, like, you're actually paying, like, brands to do that. Um, I would say, like, the I think the best thing as well that people can do, like, the way we can make such a big impact and through volunteering as well, without breaking the bank, is do stuff locally, like... I know it could take a lot of time and or thoughts or I don't know, but like maybe think of like your local area and what can be like changed in your local area. For example, I have a local community garden that we also started in 2020 before I left to go to Malta. Um, and it was just a, a, before it became a community garden, it was just like a site where people used to just dump like fridges, um, motorcycles that had been like, you know, robbed and set alight. There was, it was just all happening there. And, I had enough, <laughs> me and my neighbours had enough and we, we've changed that now into a really nice green space. Uh, we grow lots of food and um, fruit and veg there um, and have like a wildflower little meadow at the moment that's going on. So, so yeah, think locally, think how can I change my, and everywhere now because the way we're living is not great as humans, like everywhere can be improved for wildlife. Um, so just think locally and think if there's anything you can do in your local area to improve it. That looks really good on your CV, I think. Okay um malta um now that's a subject in itself really um we've had a couple of people in fact we've had alice tribe um uh, on, yeah. in conservation with in the past she works with um the uh, bird life malta yes. um i don't know if you've heard today that um oh, the bird life about malta the lost, pardon? yeah about the turtle dogs oh, they lost their yeah. battle against the government to stop um hunting uh, of turtle doves like an open season effectively during the spring as well which is just ridiculous you know to shoot a bird which is flying to its breeding ground to shoot them in the spring and then it makes it's, the just idiotic. it's just idiotic because in, even if you want to hunt them i mean obviously you want to hunt them but mm. sustainably you don't hunt in the spring you let them breed and then when they fly back then you know if you have if to you... Hunt them, but it's just it makes serious it's heartbreaking it. heartbreaking yeah i would I'm like not... to say oh sorry i was gonna i would like to say i'm shocked but i'm not shocked like with no. that news no i'm i went to malta for the first time last year for 10 days and it was one of the worst 10 days of my life even though i didn't see anything i didn't see anything being shot it's just the stories i heard and the landscape i saw and the lack of birds and i spoke to both the birders and conservationists, as well as to the hunters themselves. I spoke to hunters, wives and mothers um, to understand why, why this was going on. And I also realized that it's also going on across the whole of the Mediterranean basin. It's not just Malta, but, you know, I also understand that it goes on in Britain, you know, it goes on in yeah. most places. And yeah. we're not ones yeah. to go and point fingers because we're doing it ourselves yep exactly but i found it depressing i mean how did you how long were you there for and how did you find your experience in malta um i was there for one year and um yeah it was it was like super challenging um especially as someone who like i'm i get like uh triggered really easily with like disturbing like images and i don't like to see like any living thing suffering so um yeah, it it was it was really challenging at times, especially during that hunting season when things, especially spring, like hunting season is just chaotic. Like it's it's horrible. I feel so sorry for the volunteers because they rely on a lot of volunteers. It's like go go go. 
Um, I would say like I learned to kind of cope with it, like as um the months went on. I would say like maybe after seven months, I finally learned to kind of like you could become. A, it, this is why I had to leave. Like you become a bit desensitized. Like it's almost like you just feel super hopeless, and that's how I felt like after seven months and I knew I had to like get off the island after a year because there was um opportunity for me to stay um but I unfortunately didn't want to and like you said with the change in landscape that was one thing I really hated which also affects birds so like such a small beautiful but once beautiful island it's now just full of like buildings um yeah. it's disgusting it's, it's so bad like it's just so bad um so yeah, it yeah it wasn't it wasn't super it wasn't super pleasant, but also it was like I felt a bit rewarding like being able to at least you know do my part and um yeah do the do the small part I did it was really small part. I mean you know I was with Alice who's you know one of the sort of main players on on the island when it comes to conservation, and as you say desensitized was the word because when I when I knew her before Malta because I've known her for quite some time yeah she was a birder. And, and and she still is a birder, but now she's watching people. You know, we go out birding, but in fact, she's looking for traps. She's looking out yeah. for suspicious characters in cars. Yeah. yeah. You know, she's so focused on that. And yeah. it's like horrifying. And, you know, I think to myself, I just personally couldn't survive here because no. I was so upset. No, no. But did you actually come to blows? verbally at least with any of the sort of hunting fraternity there i mean what how close did you get did you get to the front line as it were um so i worked in two of the nature reserves um all right the, yeah so adira but they're both based in the north um adira and simar are both wetlands are very it's small wetlands, in, tiny. yeah they're really nice um and in adira um a few times i would have like hunters coming in not even really like verbally abusing me but just their like body language um yeah and like I can't explain but it just obviously it's intimidating like they're trying to uh get a reaction out of you and you just have to really just not say anything also you don't feel safe because you can't call the police because the police usually back the hunters you don't you can't rely on the police they're very corrupt um and I remember this particular uh, incident. I mean, I wouldn't say I was on the front line, but it was quite like disturbing where I was, um, the nature reserve I was working at had two flamingos that had been rehabilitated. So they had been previously shot. We had saved them and they were in our nature reserve and the hunters came in, took one and shot the other. So that was really like traumatizing and just, yeah, horrible. Um, yeah things like that like that that was probably the worst thing that i like witnessed or um yeah that was I mean, horrible it's interesting because you know i was speaking to mothers of hunters or even past hunters and i got the impression that hunters the hunters there were like the evil twin of us birders in that for them going out into the countryside was wonderful but we watch birds and they shot them. Um, and I remember being in the on the coast, we were doing a bit of sea watching. I joined the joined a bunch of guys, and the guys with Ray Galea said to yeah. me, um, don't talk too much to those two guys over there, you know, quietly. And I said, Why? And he said, They're hunters. I said, Well, hunters, but they've got binoculars and cameras. And he said, Yes. But the moment the hunting season starts, that camera is swapped out for a gun. Yes. I'm thinking, how how can that be? I mean, how can how can I, you how can you be taking pictures one moment and then shooting? Yes. Uh, they have like a really weird um, relationship with like how they. I wouldn't. I would not connect with nature, but they. Yeah, this weird relationship with birds. There, it's like that's right. A lot of the um, photographers or like hunters were photographers, so they used to take photos of the birds. And I, I even knew, I wouldn't say, yeah, I wouldn't say I was friends with him. It's really weird because it was a photographer that used to come into the reserve all the time. Um, and I didn't know for like months that he was a hunter because he was like just a normal Maltese man, like little, quite old, um, really friendly with me. You know, we had lots of conversations about birds. He was a bit weird. He used to say some a weird comments about bird life and that he doesn't like bird life Malta, but that he 
he used to come to the reserve all the time um and then yeah it was my colleague I, I you know I was talking about this photographer of my colleague and he was like he's a hunter like be careful of him but yeah I don't know. it was really weird like they're just oh some of them are very strange strange relationship with with birds because some of them are, i mean i guess it's the same else all, all over the world um they're quite good birders in fact very good birders yeah but, yeah and, and you know i know that on malta there's a, a whatsapp group that you have to be you know strenuous in terms of who gets in you know you have to go through some really serious grilling in in a way before you're let onto this because people are worried that when rarities show up the word That's gets it. Up, you know and that bird's gone I mean, when, um, I was, yeah. when I was on the islands, I remember flushing a stone curlew. <gasps> it was April last year, and I, wow, stone curlew. And I told someone that, that, at BirdLife International who said, oh, my God, that, well, A, that's the earliest we've had this year, and B, pray to God he makes it off the island, you know, because they'll be shot. And when yeah. I went to your reserve, because obviously you weren't there then, when yeah. you went, I went to your reserve, I saw, you know, some really beautiful birds, you know, like, yellow wagtails, black-headed yellow wagtails and stuff yeah. like that. And red throat pipit. And I was thinking, the moment you step out of here, literally cross the border of this res reserve, you, you're taking your own knife in, in your own wings or hands or whatever. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a weird, it's a weird, and it's, it's, you know, it's one of UK's like most hottest um, or popular holiday destination islands, you know, like, thousands or millions of people go from the UK go to Malta to so have their holiday and you would not know that this weird horrible situation was going on around you unless you know you're someone who is a birder or works in conservation or cares about nature and has done a bit of research before, before going to the island um yeah it's horrible it's horrible the the you know the nature reserves they're protected but all around the lining of those reserves like the wetlands there are hunters. I would hear gunshots like whilst at work. Hunters would shoot in. They don't care. They would shoot into the reserve like from the edge, you know, just because they can and they know they can get away with it. The amount of times I called the police, like, I just stopped calling them because they wouldn't turn up. They don't care. They're friends with the hunters. It's such a small island as well. Like it's such. Everyone knows everyone. Um. So yeah, it's it's really tough situation. Yeah, just to finish on this, I mean, I um, when I went there, I was actually on a sort of a. I went to. Uh, I'm a member of the uh, the British Travel Writers Guild, and it was their AGM. And I was shocked when I announced at the AGM. Do you realise where we are? And you realise why this island's got you know what this dark side of the island is? And they didn't yeah. even realise. And these people are journalists. So of course, it's shocking. Shocking. Yeah, it's shocking. Do you see yourself, um, I mean, you're currently working three days at Wolfenstow. What's your, yeah. what's your end goal? Uh, I have not if I'm By the way, this honest, is not a job David. interview. Like, <laughs> it's not a job interview. I'm just, <laughs> where do you see yourself in five years' time? <laughs> no, but honestly, I have no, David, I'm going to be honest, I have no idea what I'm doing. Like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I when I got this job um, at Walthamstow, um, <sighs> yeah, when I got this job at Walthamstow Wetlands as a ranger, I didn't think I would be in it um, like more than two years, maybe, just because it is an entry level role. You don't actually need a zoology degree to do my role. It's quite like visitor engagement based. So I thought maybe I would move up into like a more conservation role. Um, which is more kind of like field based. You do a lot more surveys. Um, yeah, I guess it's more like okay, you're climbing up the ladder in that sense, and that's what a lot of people in my position do. But now, um, in the past year, obviously with social media, you know, kicking in, um, it's kind of opened my eyes to like a different, maybe a different career path. And in a way, yeah, it's been. Um, a blessing in disguise that my 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 social media kicked off the way it did because I didn't think that I would enjoy like it why so much. Why did it much. kick off? Why tell us why what happened? What was because I, I find social media such a dark art. I mean I you, know, you know, I know. You try yeah. this, you get all the books, you think, well, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. How yeah, I know. Got, like five followers. Oh, what, David, what's David, the I'm... trigger? No, so okay, so 
Instagram is really weird. It's like all social media platforms, you know, you're told, oh, you need to post consistently and you need to do this and you do that. But in my case, I wasn't doing any of that. And it was one video that I posted. Um, and I have my binoculars and I'm walking into Greg's and I'm basically talking about the lady who served me at Greg's was asking if I was a tourist because I had binoculars on. And I was explaining to her, yeah, that I'm not, I watch birds. And she was really like confused. Like, and then in the and then that video just went like viral because everyone was saying, oh, but how can you bird watch in Croydon? What are you watching? Just pigeons, we don't have much. And there was a bit of hype about like bird watching in Croydon from that point. And um, that's how it happened. That's From then, engagement just went a bit crazy. And that video is honestly rubbish. So I don't understand social media. I don't get it. That one video brought a lot of followers. Yeah, because, you know, you say you don't get it. I look at what you're doing. I think this woman totally knows what she's doing. And she's, she's oh, now in yeah. all the boxes. So what yeah, is now I... tell us what is the secret? How, do, how does someone okay. get you um... know, a following? Because what you do looks like a job of work to me. I mean, I look at that and think, it, it, oh, geez, I can't go out there and make a video with that. I can't do that. I mean, I can't even edit. Forget about the editing part. It's just doing it, you know, in terms of going out there and filming yourself. I mean, that's in, a big job. In you know what? Like, I hate to admit this year, but I used to be that horrible person that would think that social media is not a proper job. Like, you know... You, how can that be your job? I never really understood it. And honestly, the only influences I ever saw as a young woman living in South London was a lot of um, uh, fashion influences, makeup influences. That's the only influences I've ever seen and known. And when I hear the word influencer, that's what I think of. That's the norm. Um, where was I going with this? <laughs> uh, so, oh yeah, so, okay, with, okay, uh, a tip. Um, I don't know, David. I think be yourself. Don't overthink it. Be yourself. Let your let your um personality shine through. Subtitles also. I don't know why. By the way, if anyone's watching and wants to be an influencer, if you add su add subtitles onto your videos, your engagement goes up like crazy. Uh, I think it's just more engaging. I don't know. Just let your enthusiasm shine through, like on your videos. That's what worked for me, anyway. <laughs> Yeah, but the other bit of the work is actually learning how to edit and all that sort of stuff. Is that, how's that? Is that easy? Because it seems very difficult to me. I tried a million times and my editing is very crude. Do you so, have, wait, David, do you have YouTube? Do you use YouTube? I've got a YouTube channel. That's which hard. Called, That's which is very called hard. The Unburder World, by the way, if you're watching this. Oh, okay. I'm going to go and tune in because that's something I need to learn. But what I use to edit on social media is like a free app called CapCut, which everyone can use. And I just edit my videos on there. I, a, a tip as well, David, like making sure that your um, videos are no longer really than 60 seconds. People's attention span is so short these days. So it needs to be really like short, snappy, a lot of enthusiasm. Um, but yeah, that's it really, I think. Do you want to uh, have your aspirations to be a presenter? My issue is, I know I seem really confident in front of the camera, but that's because it's on my own terms. It's just me and the phone. As soon as it becomes a thing where someone is, even to be honest with things like this, I do get really nervous because it's like, um, it's quite on the spot and, you know, I can't edit out things, <laughs> all my ums and hesitations and I get lots of brain farts as well so I'm not super clear when I'm communicating but so being a presenter is like yeah it's it's really fearful for me I would love to be I would love to one day yeah, be a presenter not because I want it to be about me but because I wish or I hope you know that I can inspire other young people maybe wanting to become you know a presenter or being in wildlife and maybe there's like a little Colombian girl out there who's five years old and wish she saw someone you know like herself and I could be that person because I wish I had that but the thing is you know when you become a presenter it's it's not necessarily all about being live you know it's like what you do people edit you know you you, you, you perform True. Um, so I, I think, you know, you should... Have you been approached by anyone in terms of guesting on uh, No. Like, that is, what, that's a travesty. Travesty. You should have been approached, uh, you know, all the time. 
by people. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm saying to everyone now watching this, check out <laughs> Outside with Lyra, uh, and you know what I'm talking about. It's a travesty <laughs> because I think you're a great communicator, and that's that's what's needed because in the world we're living in now, we need as many people on you know boots on ground as it were talking about conservation talking about the fact that we need to save ourselves which is basically saving the environment yeah we need more people like that yeah that's that's true i know i think i think you're right i think making it more like more normal you know more like you're just you know like the people who are watching just feel like they're part of the conversation and you know not so stiff upper lips and serious that's it not too serious i i i nature is not serious nature is so bizarre and so so wild you know the, the things that I see like and I I live in London where you know nature is quite depleted um and yeah it's bizarre so I wish that that energy was uh was seen on these like big wildlife programs that people tune into yeah because I'm disappointed with I mean I'm going to be quite open here with people like the BBC and the natural yeah because they have this thing that you have to have a degree, what have you. I remember being told several years ago by the then head of BBC Two, the, you know, the big TV channel, he said to me, David, the reason why you're not getting any work as a presenter is because you haven't got an ology. I suggest you go to university for two years and come back to us with an ology of some sort, a degree, and then I'm sure you get more work. And I'm thinking, I mean, I kind of, this... I kind of express what I'm thinking now because it wasn't. No, 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 no. Broadcast. Me neither. Me but neither. It's like, what is that about? You it's know, disgusting. We need to be talking to people on their level. You know, if most people are not, you know, university um, people, they, they are. Yeah. They live in normal lives. Yeah. We talk to them in a normal way so they can understand. Yeah. And also, can I just say everything I know? When people ask me, Lira, how do you know? Like you know all your knowledge about nature how comes when you walk outside do you know what bird that is because you like from 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 hearing it how do you know that that didn't come from my degree everything i know now did not come from a degree in fact i wish i didn't go to uni and i always say that it's a waste of it was a waste of my time and my money purely because i'm not academic like it really took me a lot like of struggle to even get to do a degree in the first place because i'm not someone who uh learns from reading and listening and sitting in a lecture hall for like two hours on end I'm I'm a doer like I like going outside and doing practical things um I just learned differently and I really struggled in um in the education system like really bad I scraped everything and I'm so happy I even scraped my zoology degree and what I know now is purely from going outside and experiencing wildlife not from my degree so yeah that is such a it's such a I hate hearing stories like that because, yeah, being a really good, like, um, is it naturalist? Is what you say? I always say the wrong one. Naturalist, right? Yeah, not naturalist. Okay, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Naturalist. Being a really good naturalist comes from just experiencing, from going outside and, and you know, observing, not from... I mean, like, also, there is a time and place where maybe you want to read up some things or whatever, but you don't need a degree. Like, you don't need a piece of paper to say you know you've got a zoology degree or zoology degree great you're a good naturalist now no it doesn't work like that so how do you feel well i mean when you go out I and mean, when you're not filming yourself you're just going out enjoying nature how, how does it make you feel like so good i can't even yeah just so good uh yeah i can't i, I you know that feeling, David. Like, it just makes me feel at peace, makes me feel good. And this is not to say, like, if you're having a rubbish day or you're going through, I don't know, like, a lot of us have probably got debt problems and family problems and going through horrible things. Doesn't mean that when you go and you, like, birdwatch, all your problems get taken away. That's not what I'm saying. Because I get that a lot. But for me, and I know for others, and it's proven scientifically, like, it does help to alleviate those feelings of stress that come with all the problems of like life um yeah like I, I, the only I can't like make you feel what I'm feeling I can only just suggest to people like go out there and try it because it's made me feel really good it's helped me deal with stress um even like today I had like a day just really really busy I've had to be in front of the laptop a lot and I could see that it was sunny 
and um I had that feeling of like you know we're heart racing because I really want to go outside because I know that it's going to make me feel good I'm going to go outside after this talk <laughs> but um yeah just I can't explain it. just being outside doesn't need to be sunny just being outside getting fresh air in your face like just feels good and do you see yourself as a role model for women um yeah I guess I do I think um the conservation that could be quite like male male dominated especially in well this is from my experience anyway my experience was like when I did do like um uh, like internships or volunteering as well a lot of like let's say the the people in the field were males uh wardens as well like a lot of wardens for like nature reserves um most of them were male um older males so I think in that sense, it kind of sometimes makes you feel as a woman or like a young woman, like, oh, yeah, like, maybe it's not for me or, you know, you start to doubt yourself a little bit. So I think... Were you, were um, you treated well? Yeah. Yeah. I, in general, like, my first, I've been treated, like, good. I have had, like, I have had, like, the one or two occasions of, like, m men over-explaining things, like but inappropriately as well and I feel like that wouldn't have happened if it was a woman or if I was a man that for example like a, a example was like um I was as a volunteer I don't want to say well when but like I was using a tool and a staff uh member came and inappropriately like showed me how to use a tool and like I can't explain it. I just felt really on edge and I just thought if I was a guy he wouldn't be he wouldn't be do, acting the way he was acting and trying to like over explain this tool, which was a very simple tool to use. Um, but yeah, like things like that could be a bit annoying. Like maybe men assuming that I can't use a tool because I'm a woman or a young woman. No, it's because they are insecure themselves and they are feeling yeah. like that's all it is. Nothing more, nothing less. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, let me ask you a really, really important question now. You ready for this, Lyra? Okay. What's your favourite animal? You can't ask that. That's a hard question. That's like the hardest question you've asked me. Um, like species specific or like group of animal? Whatever you want. Um, oh, is this is this so basic to say birds? Like, is that basic? It's whatever you want. I'm going to say birds. There's no right or wrong answer. It's just purely how you feel. The first thing that came to me is bird. And I'm not just saying this because I'm talking to the to the, to the OG urban birder. But I think... <laughs> <laughs> but it's because they're everywhere. And for me personally, it has it changed my life because um, before I discovered the world of birds, I really thought I had to travel so far and abroad to to work with wildlife. So I found out that birds are everywhere. No matter where you live in the world, there's birds. Um, especially for those that live in cities and find it difficult to connect to nature. There's birds, so okay. I'm going to go with birds. And if you could be anywhere in this world right now, where would you be? Somewhere I really wanted to go. Maybe you've gone. You can give me some tips. I really want to go to Sri Lanka because apparently for birding, it's like a bird paradise. I've heard this because um, a friend of mine that I met in Malta actually had been to Sri Lanka, which showed me all these beautiful, I don't know the birds, if I'm honest, but beautiful pictures of birds they've taken. And I was also thinking, because it's an island, maybe it'll have its own like endemic species of birds. I'm not sure, but I would love to go to Sri Lanka. Yeah, it's a, it's a great place. I'm actually going in August. Mm. Um, but I, I've been, I, I went a couple of years ago, I led a tour there. And um, mm. I think one of my favourite places was the Yala National Park. Yeah. Uh, we saw nine leopards and we saw a bunch of elephants, but there were, I mean, paradise is a good description because I remember going to a wetland there and I love wetlands, they're my favourite. Yeah. Spot. And it was just rammed with loads of different things, you know, and I, was, oh. I, just, I could have just said, just leave me here. I'll be, I was, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was absolutely incredible. So. And you're going back in August? Yeah. You're so lucky. How long are you going for? Two weeks. Are you taking binoculars? I could take you if you want. <laughs> I'd <would> love to. <laughs> Put me in a suitcase. I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, so I just want to say that um, for all those people watching Conservation With, um, 
And there may be one more coming up because the season ends in April. It's now April um, and it ends at the end of April. And I think we may have Dr. Erica McAllister, who's um, a prominent figure in the Natural History Museum. And she's got a new book out about insects. I think we'll be talking to her. She may, I'm waiting for her to agree. But um, I just want to thank Lyra for for being here and being so honest and and being such a massive inspiration. You know what? You've actually, when I first saw you and ever since, you've inspired me. And I think you are absolutely incredible. I think everyone should be out there looking at Outside with Lyra and just see how natural this woman is in terms of trying to promote the good things about watching and, and being involved in nature in urban areas. So you are, for me, a champion. Thank you. Honestly, I'm, it's an honour com coming from you. So thank you so much. Like, since I got into Birding, your name popped around so much because you are the original urban birder. So it's an honour for you to say that about me. So thank you. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and 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 um, I'd like to thank also all the people that are here today, um, all the Zoomers watching in, on the, on this. I can't even get words out now. But thank you very much. <laughs> And thanks for supporting the series, by the way. As I said, there might be one more, so check out in, uh, the website in uh, theurbanbirderworld.com. Uh, so check it out in case there's something else coming up before the end of uh, April. And I think the new series starts in October this year. So listen, thank you all. Thank you, Lyra. And don't forget, keep looking up. <laughs>